Let's start with the schematic and begin the design capture process. Going back to the new project that we previously created by clicking on File, Recent Projects, pick the new project we started. Looking at the empty schematics properties in the property panel, we see the selection filter. Under the general heading is a listing of properties. If it is not expanded, click on it. One important entry here is the units. Normally we would use mils as opposed to millimeter for the units, given that most schematic symbols were created in the mil format. Next look at the visible grid and snap settings. We will keep the 100 mil for the grid lines that you see on the sheet, but I normally modify the snap grid to 50 mil, as I find it easier to route wires on that grid. Feel free to use what works best for you. The snap distance can also be increased or decreased to make the wire connections easier when you are adding wires and you want to finish on an active pin for the component. Again, you can try different settings to see which you prefer. The sheet color is easy to change by clicking on the box with the color in it labeled sheet color. A menu will pop up and you can click on the new color to use with the mouse. Switching to the components panel, we look for components to place on the schematic from the workspaces component library. Clicking on the All from the Library Selection window, we can see the various categories of components in the library. To quickly find a particular component, we start by typing in the search window part of the name or description. We're looking for a 1K resistor, so enter 1K. This will search the selected library and list all of the components that match the search text. We'll pick the first entry just as an example and right-click on it to open up a menu. Then we select Place. Now we can place this component onto the schematic sheet using the mouse. Notice the mouse cursor changes to a large crosshair indicating we are in placement mode. Also, most importantly, at the bottom of the window to the left of center you will see text that gives hints relative to the current operation. In this case, the hint speaks of pressing the tab key to pause placement or to hit the F1 key to get more online help. Hitting tab puts the double vertical lines up indicating a pause in placement. At this point, we can go to the Properties panel that is showing the properties of the component we were about to place. This is a good time to set the reference designator for the component to R1. Hitting a carriage return ends the placement pause, so we can place the resistor. Now, while we're moving it, and before we place it, we can rotate the resistor counterclockwise by hitting the spacebar. To rotate it clockwise, hold the Shift key down and then hit the spacebar. Clicking on the schematic to place the resistor and zooming in, we see the resistor symbol and its R1 designation. Just to illustrate the effect of the selection filter, clicking on the custom button clears all the options and now we cannot select the component, or for that matter anything, until we click on the component button in the selection filter to highlight it. While this current schematic is uncluttered, the selection filter can come in handy when you want to select certain objects like wires or components in a cluttered environment. We now want to add a 2.2K resistor, so we'll go and enter 2.2K into the library search to find the 2.2K resistors. Hit the tab key to pause and change the designator value to R2, and we will place two of these to highlight the auto increment feature in placement. Whenever the designator ends with a number and we place multiple copies, the reference designator increments starting with the entered number. Now we want to add a 3906 transistor. But when we enter 3906 and do the search, we do not find it in the workspace library. When this happens, we see the notification to try Manufacturer Part Search. Clicking on that suggestion opens up the Manufacturer Part Search panel. And we see the search for 3906 was already populated, and the resulting search shows a number of possible components. We can use any component listed that has the IC icon showing. This indicates that this component has both a schematic symbol and a footprint for the PCB. We place from this panel just like we would from the Components panel using a right click and selecting Place. We'll search for and place a 3904 transistor. In this case, setting the designator to the same value as the one that we previously set, and that is Q1 for the 3906. Now, with two components having the same designator, that triggers the live electrical rule checking to indicate that there's an error by adding the squiggly lines to both of those transistors. Selecting the second transistor that we entered and then changing it to Q2 clears the error. We will add some connectors. When placing the connector, hitting the X key will mirror the part in the X axis, as you can see. Hitting the Y key mirrors the symbol along the Y axis. 
I prefer to give connectors significant designations so that the PCB on the silk screen showing the designators will be meaningful and useful. Now let's add some power and ground connections. These are done using power ports. These are special in that they connect globally across the schematics and the hierarchy, if any. We will use the drop-down menu on the top of the tool window and click on the ground icon to be able to place the ground port. Just like with components, tapping the spacebar rotates the power point symbol while it is still selected and is not placed. Now with ground placed, either hit the escape key or right click to escape placement mode. Notice the three pin component name overlaps with the ground port. We can select the text with a left mouse click and move it. Note the squiggly line on pin 3. This indicates that this is a single node connection type of error. We can ignore this for now as we will be adding more grounds later. Adding a power port for the positive supply comes with the default label of VCC. We can change this by hitting the tab key and entering the new power name, in this case, plus 12. Hitting carriage return allows us to do the placement. Now we are ready to start wiring up the schematic. Click on the wire icon at the top of the menu area and left mouse click to start the wire on the endpoint of the in connector pin. Drag over now to pin one of our two and left click again to drop the line onto it. Did you notice the shortcut key that popped up for adding a wire? Control W can and should be used as it is faster. At some point, for the operations you perform frequently, you will start to remember and use the shortcuts. Now let's use a net label to connect up Q2 pin 3 to the out connector pin 1. Net labels allow the user to create and assign net names to wires. If a wire does not have an assigned net label, the tool will generate a net name based on the instance and pins on the net. First, let's add a wire to Q2 and to the connector to make it easier to see the net label. Although it's not needed, the net label could in fact be placed directly on the pin. Then we will use a net label and add the same label to both wires. Right-click on an empty part of the schematic to open up the pop-up menu. Select Place, and in the sub-menu, pick Net Label. Notice the underlying letters P and N. They would perform the same net label operation and would be faster. Again, hit the tab key and enter the name for the wire and then carriage return and place the same net label so both wires that we just added. Remember the auto increment feature will update the net label as well. So hit the tab key and change the second net label number back to one. At this point, these two are connected electrically in the design because they have the same name and are on the same schematic sheet. We can copy objects in the schematic by selecting them and hitting Control C to copy. Let's copy the plus 12 power port to make the rest of the connections. To paste the copy, use Control V and then move it to where you need to place it with the left mouse click. Again, rotation of the selected moving object is possible with the spacebar. We want to move the out connector and its connections, so to select that group of objects, we left click on the mouse and drag over the group to select it. The direction of dragging is important. Dragging from left to right only selects the objects that are fully enclosed by the drawn rectangle, while dragging from right to left selects everything inside the rectangle and touching it. Adding in the selection filter at this point from the properties panel would allow us to have some very powerful selections. Experiment for yourself to see how this works. Next we will show the components cut wire feature. Let's start by selecting the R3 resistor and let's move it until it's on top of the wire as shown. Now releasing the mouse, R3 gets placed on the wire, cutting it and effectively inserting the resistor between the IN1 connector and R2. To delete a wire, select it and then hit the delete key. Moving things around, we can now demonstrate the stretching of a wire that is connected between components. Selecting R3, we can move it towards Q1, and the wire extends to maintain the connection. When the pins of two objects, in this case R3 and Q1, are overlapping, if you drag R3 away from Q1, a wire will automatically be generated maintaining the connection. This is a simple design that easily fits onto a single schematic sheet, but we want to demonstrate a multi-sheet flat design. To add another schematic to the project, right-click on the project file and select Add New to Project, then Schematic. 
Now we have a second schematic in this project. Let's move some of the circuit from sheet 1 to sheet 2. We should first save this update to the project. Clicking on the project, it will ask to save the new schematic, and then we can save the project file. The project file is now updated to include the second schematic as part of the project. Again, the project file does not have the contents of the schematic. It merely has the links to all of the files that are associated with this project. To move the out connector to the second sheet, first select it and then hit Control X to cut. Switch to the new schematic by clicking on it in the project panel so we can paste the selection we just cut. If we just do a simple paste or Control V, we do get the circuit pasted, but all the reference designators are reset. To undo this paste, hit Control Z. In general, hitting Control Z will undo most operations from placements, wires being added or removed, etc. There is a way to preserve the original designator naming using the Edit Paste Special function. Selecting now Paste as themselves. Click OK, and now we see the original circuit and its designators pasted. Now, with the circuit spread across two schematics, the NetLabel Out 1 does not work to make the connection. NetLabels, again, only work on the same sheet. To connect from one sheet to another or up in the hierarchy, we need to use ports. Ports provide connections between sheets in the design and are used with multiple flat schematic designs as well as hierarchical ones. To add a port, we right-click on the open section of the schematic and pick Place, then Port. This puts a port on the mouse. Clicking once fixes the start of the port symbol and then the second click the end of the symbol. After placing the port, we select it. And in the Properties panel, we want to edit its name. Ensure that the I.O. type is set correctly. Here it's an input because it's coming from the other schematic. To adjust the size of the port, click on it and then grab the endpoint and drag it out. Use Control c to copy the port. And then we go to the first sheet and Control v to paste it. Selecting the port, we now need to change its I.O. type to output. Now let's wire this port to the out one labeled wire from Q2 pin 3. This will provide the connection across the schematics. Assuming we're done, how do we get the design from the schematics to the PCB? Using the Design drop-down menu, we pick Update, PCB Document option. This kicks off a series of actions, starting with comparing the schematics design with the empty PCB document. Using the unified database, we can see that there are differences between the two. These differences are used to generate an Engineering Change Order, or ECO. This lists all of the needed actions to bring the PCB document to match that of the schematics. To update the PCB, click on the Execute Changes button. You will see green check marks for each line indicating success. I always recommend clicking on the Only Show Errors to ensure that everything was transferred correctly. Click on Close, and now we see the PCB with two red regions off to the right of the board outline. These regions are the rooms and in each room are all the components from the respective sheets in the schematic. I find the white background for the PCB view to be a little harsh. To change that, open the View Configuration panel and scroll down to the System Colors sections. Looking at the System Colors, the Sheet Line Area color is defined as black lines with white area. Click on the icon to gray it out and also to add a slash so as not to display these in the PCB view. Now you can see the effect. This is how I normally work in the PCB window. This system color can be useful, however, when creating documentation later, so keep that in mind. The rooms auto-generated by the schematic sheets can be used to move all of the components of the schematic sheet as a group. Once their rough placement is done, I recommend deleting the rooms by clicking on them and hitting the Delete key. Please do not be tempted at this point to start layout as we have not set the rules or the board shape and the layer stack up. These must be done first before proceeding with any layout. At this point, it'd be good to update your workspace after completing the schematics and at the point of transferring the design to the PCB. To do that, right-click on the project file and select Make Project Available Online. This opens up a window for the commit, and we can add notes to the committed version, keeping the Use Version Control checkbox set. With version control enabled, we can see the progress and the evolution of the project files, and backtrack if we need to. 
The project will now be uploaded into the workspace, and as this is the first time upload, you will see this notification window suggesting the many ways you can now use the saved project on the workspace. Renaming the first schematic by right-clicking on it in the project panel and selecting Rename, we can give it a proper name. We could have done this earlier, but at this point we can illustrate how to update the workspace project when the local copy has been updated. Once the first schematic was renamed, we see the schematic line entry in the project listing changes from a checkmark to a circle. We also see asterisks indicating that it needs to be saved. And in fact, we see the project file has a notification suggesting the project should be saved to the workspace. Click on the Save to Server, and a window pops up showing the changes to be uploaded. We enter a node and click OK. Now the project is updated and matches the local copy. We should update the PCB now that we have renamed the schematics. Afterwards, save the PCB, update to the server to ensure that we are in sync between the local copy and the workspace. In this video, we've covered schematic properties, schematic capture, and how connectivity works in Altium Designer. Then we transferred the design to the PCB. Finally, we updated the workspace from the local copy of the project to ensure that we have the saved current state of the design. In our next video, we will start on the PCB.